to talk about uh, management of upper GI bleed and especially in the presence of my teachers, uh, Dr. Rakesh Chandra was my guide and Dr. Navneet Kumar. Uh, so, bleeding proximal to the ligament of teats. So, this ligament is from the right crura of the diaphragm to the DJ flexor. The site above this is known as an upper GI bleed. So, it usually manifests either in the form of fresh blood hematemesis or a coffee ground emesis, which occurs in around 50% of the patients. It may occur in the form of melina or hematogesia, which constitutes around 98%. And causes predominantly are either non variceal, which occurs in 80%, and variceal, which is 20%. So, if you see the etiology of upper GI bleed, the peptic ulcer disease, erosive disease, and variceal bleed constitutes the majority, around 80%, both in the Western as well as in the Indian series. And if you see, besides this, what we have is esophagitis, melorivis tear, malignancy, that is CA stomach, CA esophagus, or the vascular lesion like angiogdesias, esophageal ulcers, or unknown cause. So what's, why we are talking about this particular disease is, if you see, the in-hospital mortality since 1989 has reduced. It was to the tune of around 11% in 89, and now in 2009 data what we have is to the tune of around 6%. So upper GI bleed still carries a mortality to the tune of around 5 to 10%, which is high. So I'll be discussing this in following headings, resuscitation, history, localization, and therapy, which is endoscopic, pharmacological and surgery. So this is the most important slide of upper GI bleed. Maintain airway, breathing and circulation as you do in any patient coming to an emergency. Ensure that there are two venous excess, two large bore cannulas, 16 gauge or the 18 gauge cannulas. You can place a central line just to be sure that the volume replacement is adequate. And resuscitation is initially done with crystalloid, that is ringer lactate or the normal saline. And once you do the resuscitation, simultaneously you will have to send the blood for coagulation studies as well as grouping and cross-matching. The other important point which I want to stress upon is blood should be transfused only if the hemoglobin is below 7. And the target is to maintain a hemoglobin of between 7 to 9. You should not think that if you transfuse blood to make a hemoglobin of 11, it's going to benefit the patient. No. It has been shown clearly in studies that if you over-transfuse, then rebleeding as well as the mortality increases. So what is needed is a target of 7 to 9 and transfusion only if the hemoglobin is below 7. Very important. Second point is about the platelet transfusion. This platelet needs to be transfused only if it falls below 50,000. So if you have a platelet count of around say 80,000 and you assume that platelets are functioning adequate, you don't need to transfuse platelet. Or if you have a platelet count below 1 lakh and you expect platelet dysfunction, that is function of platelet is inadequate, then you transfuse. So history is primarily meant to understand that what is the site of the bleed, that is whether it's an upper GI, it's a small bowel bleed or a colonic bleed. You will assess history of pain, hematemesis, melina. Hematemesis usually points that there's an upper GI source. Hematochesia, that is fresh blood in the stools, you can have with an upper GI source. In that case, blood pressure usually drops down, that the bleeding is very brisk. History of peptic ulcer bleed, history of prior surgery, points to the ulcer as a cause. History of alcohol intake again becomes very important to understand that patient may be having chronic liver disease. Medication, that is history of aspirin, clopidogrel, antiplatelet agent is very important as you need to tailor them when there is a patient with bleed, upper GI bleed. Again, steroids were predisposed to ulcer disease. As far as examination is concerned, pulse rate, blood pressure, you will have to see the signs of chronic liver disease in the patient. Abdominal examination, if you see patomegaly, splenomegaly along with the scientists, it suggests that possibly the patient may have chronic liver disease. 
and particularly examination if it shows fresh red blood then maybe the lower GI is a source. So these are the four images I have put. Uh, this image clearly shows that there are predominant vessels distended afterwards. This is a situs. Can anyone me tell what is this? Absolutely. Spider nevi, presence of gynecomastia, presence of xanthelasma may indicate the presence of chronic liver disease. Can we have this lights down so that these focus will? Again, this is pigmentation, again seen in hemochromatosis, one of the cause of chronic liver disease. And this is KF ring, which is usually well seen on slit lamp examination, especially in the patient with Wilson's disease as a cause of chronic liver disease. So, one of the very important points to understand is the differentiating between a variceal and a non-variceal feed. So, in histone examination, you may get some points to suggest that it's variceal or non-variceal. There are some scores which have been validated to discriminate between variceal and non-variceal. One of these scores is, if this is a uh, formula, 3.1 into previous diagnosis of cirrhosis, if it is present, its score is 1. If it is absent, score is 0. To this, you add 1.5 into presence of red vomitus. Presence is 1, absence is 0. Again, plus 1.2 into presence of nasogastric aspirate. Red is 1, absence is 0. If this score is greater than 3.1, this suggests that possibly the patient has variceal bead rather than a non-variceal bead. Why it's important to differentiate between variceal and non-variceal, I'll come to that. What is the role of nasogastric tube? So, do you think nasogastric tube should be routinely placed in patients with upper GI bead? Anyone? Do you routinely place nasogastric tube? Okay. So, the routine placement is not recommended. It's very clear. It has been found that if you place this, there is no significant improvement in the clinical outcome. The only reason to place a nasogastric tube may be one, sometimes there is melina, and you place a right tube and you find that the fresh blood is coming, then we, you can be sure that it's bleed from an upper GI source rather than from a small valve bleed. Second is the risk stratification. Risk stratification means you are trying to understand whether this patient is a high risk candidate for rebreed mortality or the risk is not that high. So if risk is not high, you may not need to admit the patient so you can triage these patients well. So risk stratification is usually done with a Blatchford score. Again, it may be difficult to remember this score. You can just paste this in your clinic so this includes basically systolic blood pressure, the blood urea nitrogen, hemoglobin level, pulse rate, melina, syncope, hepatic disease and the cardiac failure. So these points, if the score is between 0 to 1, that means these patients do not need early endoscopy and no hospital admission is needed. You can try these patients well and this has been suitably validated and in 90% of the patients it is accurate. So what pre-endoscopy management, most of these patients with a variceal or non-variceal significant bleed deep endoscopy. But before doing endoscopy you have to be clear of certain things. One, endotechial intubation should be done in patients with ongoing active hematemesis, encephalopathy or vegetation. You have to correct the INR. INR should be less than 2.5. Some considered is less than 1.5. This is corrected by giving fresh frozen plasma. If the patient is on oral anticoagulant, you need to stop that. If the patient is on anti drugs, I'll come to the ESG recommendation that is European society. What do they recommend if the patient is on anti drug? This is a common scenario in patients with cardiac problems on anti drug who presents with GI bleed. Everyone is wondering whether to stop aspirin, whether to stop clopidogrel. I will come to that. And what you have to realize is anti platelet agent discontinuation for restoration of the normal platelet degradation, it takes around 5 to 7 days. So, this is the ESG, European Society guidelines, which I was pointing to. If you have a high risk endoscopic stigma, so high risk endoscopic stigma means that on endoscopy if you find a spurt, if you find a visible vessel, then and if the patient is on anti platelet agent for primary prophylaxis, not for secondary prophylaxis, you can stop aspirin 
and resume aspirin after a ulcer heals. If the patient is on aspirin, uh, antiplatelet agent for secondary prophylaxis, and this patient is on aspirin loan, you need to resume, stop aspirin and resume aspirin by day three. If the patient is on dual antiplatelet agent with a high risk endoscopic stigma, you need to continue aspirin and without stopping. However, if the patient has got low risk endoscopic stigma, that is, it is a clean based ulcer and antiplatelet agent is being given for primary prophylaxis, you need to withhold aspirin and resume aspirin at the time of discharge. Not the time of the ulcer heal, but at the time of discharge, you can resume. And if the antiplatelet agent is being given for secondary prophylaxis, you need to continue acetylsalicylic acid, that is aspirin, if the patient is on aspirin alone. If the patient is on dual antiplatelet agent, you, can, you need to continue both, you don't need to stop any. So most important in the pharmacological management of non diacetyl bleed is a high dose proton pump inhibitor. The dose again becomes very important. It's an 80 milligram bolus followed by 8 milligram per hour infusion. So it's very important. It's not just PPI, BD, TDS, but 80 milligram bolus followed by 8 milligram per hour infusion continued at least for 3 to 5 days. And this has been found to decrease the high risk stigma and decrease the need for endoscopic hemostasis. Drugs sometimes just very commonly used tenemixamic acid or octetride for non variceal bleed is not recommended. Here one more point is you should test all these patients for H. pylori infection. If they are positive, H. pylori should be eradicated and the acute settings sometimes what happens the H. pylori becomes negative. So you should be testing for H. pylori again in this patient after a certain time. If they are positive, you should again retreat these patients. So mechanism action of PPI, what PPI actually does is increases the pH of the gastric pH. By this increasing the pH, it primarily prevents the fibrin dissolution. And when the fibrin dissolution is prevented, the clot formation happens. This is what the PPI actually does. As far as omeprazole, pantoprazole, rabiprazole, esomeprazole, and all sorts of those, uh, you can choose any, it doesn't make any difference. Should not be preferred in these settings. Coming to the variceal bleed, if you have a suspicion of variceal bleed based on history examination, you should be giving patient octetide, which is again dose is 50 milligram bolus followed by infusion of 50 milligram, continued for two to five days. The other drug which can be given is terlipresin and somatostatin. If the patient doesn't respond, that is, you have given the drug. The patient continues to bleed, you can give the bolus again and if after giving the bolus, after continuing it for two to day, three days, the patient doesn't respond, these patients can be subjected to tips provided it is available. The other important point is, if it is a variceal bleed, you have to give prophylactic antibiotics. So antibiotics is not recommended in each and every bleed. If it's a variceal bleed, you have to give cephraxone. Again, dose is very clear, only one gram once a day, not more than that, for five to seven days, and you need to stop after that. Or norfloxacillin, again, 400 milligram BD for five to seven days. So antibiotic prophylaxis primarily to prevent secondary bacterial peritonitis. When should an endoscopy be done? So if the patient immediately comes to you with a massive upper GI bleed, don't rush in the for an upper GI endoscopy straight away. What is recommended is endoscopy should be done within 24 hours after resuscitation. So first and foremost, very important point is to resuscitate the patient adequately. Once you have resuscitated, then this patient should be subjected to an upper GI endoscopy, preferably within 24 hours. So it's 24 hours, not 12 hours. So these are lesions what I wanted to show. The first lesion you can see F1A is a spurt, second F1B is a ooze. F2, again, first is the visible vessel. A, B is an adherent clot. C is again melanin pigmentation of the ulcer. And F3 is a clean based ulcer. So these are again endoscopic images. What is the importance? The importance is if you have the last two, you do not need any endoscopic therapy. You do an endoscopy, you are done with it. But if you have the first four, these first four, you need an endoscopic therapy for this. 
So why these figures are important? Because if it is an active bleed, you see a spurt, or if it is a non-bleeding visible vessel, you see the further re-bleeding risk is to the tune of around 55% if you don't do an endotherapy. Surgery is needed around 35% of these patients, mortality to the tune of 11%, which is very high. So coming to the endoscopic hemostasis, hemostasis techniques, that is once you do an upper GI, you see a lesion, what do you do? So different modalities which are used, injection therapy, thermal therapy, mechanical techniques. Injection therapies, primarily you inject epinephrine, that is adrenaline, and the mechanism by which it acts is basically tamponade, tamponade and vasoconstriction. Hemostasis achieves in 900% of the patients. However, there's a risk of rebleed to 40, 15 to 40% of patients may rebleed. Again, the volume you can inject around up to 30 ml of adrenaline. And this is the needle which is used for injection therapy. However, injection therapy alone is no more done. If you do an injection therapy, you have to combine it with other methods, which are thermal methods or mechanical methods. And once you combine the rebleeding rate, emergency surgery and mortality decreases. So adrenal injection therapy alone is not preferred. So this is a video showing what we actually do. This is one of our patients. So I was trying to this correct this for quite some time, still it's not playing. I just see. I do have, but I have many videos actually that become a problem to open that every time. Okay, I think we'll leave that. No problem. Okay, so second, first, what was I, I was trying to show you was injection therapy. I see whether the other videos work or not. So thermal therapy is again, I, these slides just show you the mechanism, what we exactly do and how it works. So thermal therapy, when you pass current, the tissue, tissue gets overheated. There is edema, coagulation of tissue protein and the contraction of vessels and arteries. And this leads to activation of the clotting cascade. So this is how the thermal therapy helps. For thermal therapy, what you do, what we do is a heater probe and a gold probe. This is how they look like. The first one is a heater probe. The other is a gold probe. And the other is an argon plasma coagulation probe, APC probe. So normally when we do APC, we have a high success rate. This is initial hemostasis to the tune of around 76%, rebleeding around 6%. And if you add a second hemostatic technique to this APC, argon plasma coagulation, you achieve hemostasis to the tune of around 100%. And this is what the figure shows. First, you don't touch. So this is a non-contact technique. You don't touch the lesion. You are at a distance around, say, one to two millimeters from the lesion when you do an APC. So let's see whether this video plays or not. Uh, so that's not good. Okay. The argon plasma coagulation we are trying to do in the patient with uh, this is Gabe's gastric antral vascular ectasia. These are linear lesions along the antrum. Now this is an APC probe. This again, when you coagulate, it becomes white. So this is what you coagulate all the lesions which are seen and it heals very nicely. So very efficacious to do. Uh, this is argon plasma coagulation. I'm sorry about that, but actually uh, there's some compatibility issue. Uh, okay, uh, so mechanical technique, that is the clip. 
it achieves hemostasis in around 100%, low rebleeding rate when it's compared with adrenaline, ethanol, or hypertonic saline, and combination of hemoglobin and adrenaline superior to hemoglobin alone, failure rate again in 10 to 25%. So these are how the clips look like. These are three different types of clip. The differences between the size, whether it can be rotated or not, whether once you close it, you can open it or not, and again, the cost. So these are different clips available as of date. So, uh, <coughs> so this again, a patient again with a massive bleed and we clipped it. So you can see this is a stomach, large ulcer. Also, you can't see this because a spurt coming out of the big spurt here. And we decided to do clipping in this particular case. The other option available is an injection therapy. You can use a heater probe as well. So this is a spurt, this can be very scary actually. So uh, we used clip and once you apply the clip, usually the bleeding stops absolutely suddenly on the table. So you can see that now the clip is going in and we have held the clip, possibly there's a visible vessel which was bleeding. And now the first clip is being applied. Once you apply the clip, bleeding stops all together. Here in this particular case, we decided to apply the second clip. And once, even on the first clip, we were settled, set, Despite that, we went ahead and did the second clip. So this was the second clip which was being applied. And once you once we applied these two clips, the bleeding stopped altogether. So these are hemoclip. Again, very effective. And on this, you can obviously add the other uh, injection therapy as well if you want. Okay, so the endoscopic therapy, if you see the dual endoscopic therapy is superior to epinephrine alone, but not to thermal or mechanical monotherapy. Thermal devices, clerosin, clips, and fibrin glue are comparable, all are similar. However, epinephrine mon monotherapy, as I mentioned, is inferior to other interventions, and all endoscopic therapies are superior to pharmacotherapy, that if you give only pantoprazole, it's less is inferior if you compare it to endoscopic therapy. There are some other new endoscopic therapy. One of it is very easy to use is a hemospray. So hemospray primarily is a highly absorptive, non-absorbable material, which basically creates a mechanical barrier. So it's created a mechanical barrier for hemostasis. Moreover, it adds to platelet aggregation and activates the clotting factors. This is how the hemospray looks like. And in one of the, we use this uh, sparingly, sometimes when, uh, so you can see this, this is how this hemospray is done. This is again a lesion, a large ulcer with ooze which appears to be settled at this point of time. So this is how we do hemospray. So this is a, this is a powder, hemospray which has come now and then you can just try to cover whole of the ulcer with hemospray and the bleeding gets controlled. So you can see now another flush of hemospray here. So second look endoscopy, it's usually not recommended unless you have patients with high risk lesions where the chance of rebleeding is very high. There only you go ahead and do a second look endoscopy. Warfarin the oral anticoagulant should be resumed after seven to 15 days for most patients until less you have atrial fibrillation, heart valves, or a recent deep vein thrombosis when you started within the first, after the first seven days. So these are the predictors which tell you that the chance of rebleed is high. This is hypotension, hemoglobin less than 10, presence of fresh blood, active bleeding, and the presence of ulcer. These are the factors which tells you that the patient may rebleed. Coming to the varicel bleed, three important Things you have to remember in varicel bleed. First is the endoscopic varicel ligation, very effective. Endoscopic varicel obturation, which you do with a glue. Again, important for gastric varix. And endoscopic injection sclerotherapy, which you do in case of esophageal varices. Sometimes when the varices are small, you cannot band it. Then you do endoscopic injection sclerotherapy. Here, the most complications are fought within endoscopic injection sclerotherapy where there may be risk of perforation to the tune of around 20 to 60 percent has been reported so this is how 
the endoscopic variceal obliteration is done, that is the EVL. So you can see the large esophageal varices. These are the huge varices, grade 4 varices for say on, on endoscopy, obliterating the total esophageal lumen. And once you see this varice, you start from the lower end and what you do is to apply band. These are simple rubber bands. So you can see we are sucked in, there is a red out and once it is red out, we release the band which is applied to the tip of the endoscope. The first column has been banded. Now we catch hold of the second column. Again, the same procedure and you obliterate all the visible columns starting from the G junction. So that's how you do an EVL that is endoscopic variceal ligation. And then the And this is again blue injection. Blue injection is again sometimes a very scary thing to do. And uh, we had one death on the table while doing this glue. So this is a patient. Uh, he has a large gastric varix. You can see an active spurt here. So in this, what we do is to inject sinoacrylate glue. So this is we have injected with a sclerotherapy needle. Then you, as soon as you inject and if it's adequately done, the bleeding stops altogether immediately. You can see the pool of blood already in the stomach. This is a patient who presented with a massive spurt when we took him off for an upper GI. And once you do it, uh, it's, it gets totally obliterated. However, it has got complications of pulmonary embolism can happen. And sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, we had once a patient dying on the table within one minute of injection of uh, this sinoacrylate glue. So, rebleed prevention, once you have controlled the bleeding, then you need to prevent further occurrence of bleeding, which you do by repeated endotherapy. With drugs, what you can give is propanol. You can increase this to the maximum of 320. What you have to monitor is the pulse rate. It has to be not less than 55. Then you titrate the dose. The other drugs which can be used are thyroidolol and nadolol. So this, uh, again, the uncommon cause of GI bleed, uh, I'm, I will not play this video again, it will take time. So this is a spurt from the G junction, what we did here is banded this, the bleeding stopped. This is a dulophos lesion which was actively bleeding, we injected water, this blood coming repeatedly, we again banded it and it got stopped. This is a small polyp in the stomach, once we cut, but once we cut this polyp, on the stalk we saw that there was some blood, so we applied clip in this particular case, and this is a case of post EPT bleed. I'll just show you this post EPT bleed. So uh, again, post EPT bleed managed with uh, injection adrenaline, adrenaline therapy. So you can see we are doing an ERCP here, which again is a rare cause of an upper GI bleed. You can see a massive bleeding here when we did a spring trot me. We went ahead and placed a stent and after that we injected adrenaline at the apex of the spring trot me and the bleeding stopped here. So uh, this is again one of the rare causes of bleed that you can have. <coughs> So last two slides, the algorithm, this again very important summarizing slides for a non-variceal bleed, you do an upper GI after adequate resuscitation, you start with PPI, proton pump inhibitors in the dose as I mentioned, 80 milligram followed by IV, 8 milligram per hour and then you do an endoscopy is done within, an, within 24 hours, if there is no active bleeding, no endoscopic intervention, if there is a visible vessel, you either do a thermal or a mechanical hemostasis as I showed you, mechanical is with clip, if there is an active bleeding then you inject adrenaline is 1 into 10,000 along with the thermal treatment, not alone, if there is a re-bleed you again can resort to endoscopic therapy, if the second endoscopic therapy fails this patient is not going to respond to endoscopic therapy, can be subjected to surgery or transarterial chemoembolization which is a radiological procedure. Coming to the variceal bleed, again, resuscitation is the first and foremost step. Once you are sure that possibly the patient has variceal bleed, you go ahead and 
give uh, drugs, as I mentioned, terliprasin, octotride, or somatostatin. Once you do an endoscopy within 24 hours, you find esophageal varices, you do band ligation, and if after band ligation the bleeding is controlled, you put these patients on beta blockers, which is usually propanolol. If you have a contraindication to propanolol, you give carbidolol. And in these patients with child C and B and C cirrhosis who are having repeated bleeds, tips, transjugular, intrahepatic, photosystemic shunt is an option available in few centers. If you have a gastric variceal bleed, you inject sinoacrylate glue in these patients. And if these patients don't respond to your glue injection therapy, again, these patients they can be taken for transjugular intrahepatic photosystemic shunts. One of the saving measures what can be done is a balloon tamponade which we say which we call as Sengstaken Blakemore tube, SB tube. So in acutely bleeding patients, if the patient has come to the emergency, bleeding is not being controlled on, it, on the drugs, the patient is bleeding profusely, endoscopy is not available in the night, then you can go ahead and place an SB tube which you can keep it safely for 24 hours before you deflate it. Thank you. This glue injection via uh, endoscopy. Yeah, so intentionally I haven't con uh, covered the techniques exactly involved. So, but to answer that, glue injection, uh, what we do uh, to prevent the complication is one, we inject only in aliquots of 1 ml each. So, at a particular point, we inject only 1 ml. We can go ahead and inject further 1 1 ml, maybe the total ml, maybe 5 ml, 7 ml, whatever it is. But at a particular site, you inject only 1 ml. The reason is, if you inject more, if the flow is more, the portal hypertension, the portal pressure is more, the glue may be carried off to the pulmonary vessels and may lead to pulmonary embolism. So the most important thing that you have to remember is inject only not more than 1 ml at a time, one. And second, you have to be experienced enough because if the glue sticks to your scope, your scope is damaged. So your assistant should be very much tuned to cleaning the scope as soon as you withdraw the scope. It should be washed immediately so that you don't damage your scope.